and Rogue Sun issue number one is written by Ryan Parrott, with art by Abel, colors by Chris O'Halloran, and letters by Becca Carey. And this book begins with a superhero by the name of Rogue Sun doing battle against an unknown foe. Rogue Sun at first seems like he has the upper hand, but the tide is quickly turned as he suddenly loses control of his powers and is brutally beaten before a family hears a large boom and comes across Rogue Sun's body. We cut to a week later where we meet Dylan Abernathy, who is quite the bully as he's keeping a kid named Byron in a locker for not doing his homework. Eventually, he lets him out when we get a brief moment with Dylan's apparent love interest, Vanessa Myers, who walks right past him, not saying a word. Later at Dylan's house, a man by the name of Cotton Simmons is there to tell Dylan's mother and him of his father, Marcus Bell's death, of which Dylan seems satisfied with the news. They are invited to the reading of his will, and so, a few days later, Dylan and his mom show up at a giant mansion where the two meet Marcus's other family. The reading begins, and while Marcus's wife has left the estate and all of the money, Dylan inherits the Sunstone, much to the shock of the kids. It's here Dylan learns that his father was a superhero, and that he was chosen to be the next rogue son. We then cut to an auction where a villain by the name of Suave comes in with his gang to steal something called the Tome. Back with Dylan, his mother tells him of how she met Marcus, but then the stone ignites and Dylan experiences what's known as the Call. And although his mother says that he doesn't have to go, Dylan figures he can use this new position to make life better for them by being a better rogue son. Swab in the meantime is nearly finished when Dylan comes crashing in, literally landing in the garbage. He tries to fight, but his inexperience shows, of which Swab quickly catches on and eventually ascertains that this is not his old nemesis, and easily dispatches Dylan but chooses to leave him alive. It's after Swab gets away that Dylan hears a voice and looks up to see his father, who tells Dylan that he's embarrassing him. And yeah, I'm gonna say this book was enjoyable. Because much like Kyle Higgins with his Radiant Black series, this feels like Ryan Parrott is really trying to do a tokusatsu that's Americanized for a Western superhero audience. And there's just a lot to like in this book. I mean, we have our main character named Dylan who finds out that his estranged father was a superhero and he now has to fill these shoes. And what makes the setup pretty interesting is the fact that Dylan's not exactly the greatest of guys. I mean, for all intents and purposes, he's a bit of a bully, you know. He locks up a kid in a locker for, you know, not doing his homework for him and stuff, and just seems to have this really big chip on his shoulder, and yeah, you know, I admit there definitely are moments where I'm like, maybe they take the whole, like, attitude thing with him a little too far, especially in scenes like where he finds out that his dad is dead and he does take some kind of pleasure it seems in the thought of maybe his dad died a very horrible, gruesome, painful death. And in some fashion sometimes makes this book feel like it could be the potential start of a supervillain story. But I think this might be potentially in service to the character as this means he starts from a very low point and has to really work his way to the top of being a superhero. And I do find myself latching on to the potential of who this character could be. As far as his first outing goes, I'm glad he butchered it, you know? I'm glad it wasn't like a scenario where he just gets his powers and is like suddenly just good at kicking ass everywhere. And in fact, you know, botches the first job like really bad. Though I do admit, I think he got off a little too easy against Suave as, you know, yeah, he was trying to stop Suave and everything, but Suave is like, you know, I, I don't really like to kill people, so yeah, I'll go ahead and let you live, especially knowing that you're not the guy that, you know, keeps stopping me. And I do kind of dislike it when villains have the heroes like dead to rights and they decide not to kill them for some reason. I mean, Suave at least says that he doesn't like to kill people, but should still be constantly thinking about, well, maybe if this kid keeps training, eventually he will be just as good, if not better than the previous Rogue Son, so maybe I should take care of him now. I guess personally what I really would have liked to have seen instead is that Dylan just completely gets wasted and Suave is maybe about to kill him and Dylan just barely slinks away with his life in sort of like coming to this concept and idea that, oh my gosh, 
I am just in way over my head. And through that knows that he really needs to buckle down if he wants to make this work. And then there's Dylan's siblings who are quite interesting as characters because they're the exact opposite of Dylan. Because unlike Dylan, who never actually knew his father, these kids, you know, were raised by the guy, you know, grew up with him and stuff. Maybe not necessarily having love for him because, you know, I didn't really see much to point towards that, but they definitely have a respect for what he did. And I really liked their expressions when Dylan was given the Sunstone because especially on the youngest, there definitely seems to be a look of not just disappointment and shock, but also potential betrayal. Because these kids may feel like, well, since Marcus stuck around and, you know, raised us and stuff, that we're owed the Sunstone. I mean, why give it to this kid that you obviously wanted nothing to do with? Which I think kind of adds a little bit of extra layers to the story too, because essentially we also have a kind of who done it sort of mystery going on with who killed Marcus. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this person knew his identity, knew exactly what his weakness was, and really? Who knows the guy better than his own family? Because everything that we've seen so far shows that he was as transparent with them as possible. I mean, did he have secrets? We're not quite sure yet, but in the interim, there's nothing to suggest so. And this whole situation is one of those instances where I wish we had gotten maybe just a little bit more out of Dylan's mom, because as she stated that, you know, when it came to her marriage with Marcus, it just completely failed and she figured it was due to the fact that it was his life as a superhero, but then later finding out that he got married, had a whole nother family, you know, she just realized that, okay, that was obviously not the case and most likely felt like discarded trash. And I kind of wish we got just a little bit more emotion out of her, especially after Dylan gets the sunstone, like maybe there'd be an instance of her just you know, taking the stone from him or whatever and say, no, you're not gonna have it. This is not happening. In fact, I think a more effective setup would be her trying to make sure that Dylan does not become the next rogue son. Like she's the one that tells the guy that, hey, we're not going to the will reading or anything like that. Dylan is to have nothing to do with this guy. And through whatever reason, Marcus still ends up getting the sunstone. But either way, I really like the tension that these two families feel where it's kind of like, you know, one, again, feels like they're owed the Sunstone and the other side with, you know, the mom potentially not wanting it and then the son sort of like, okay, you know, maybe I can use it in some fashion to make our lives a little better. But if there was overall, like, one thing that I just did not like about the story was the relationship between Dylan and Byron because upon their initial like setup and stuff like that you know Byron's shoved in a locker and Dylan's like yeah you're not coming out until you agree to do my homework or whatever and then you know he lets Byron out and the two start walking down the hall and talking with the sort of banter that kind of makes it feel like they could be friends. To me it was a little confusing because the relationship here is a little unclear, but I hope through continuous exploration and interactions between these two characters, it, that does become a little more clear. When it comes to the art, I think the art was very well done in this book. It's very colorful. The action sequences are great. The only thing I'm kind of looking at uh, from a design standpoint are, is like the Rogue Sun suit, as well as how the enemy characters kind of look to me. Because I'm just gonna flat out say it, Rogue Sun straight up looks like the Hellbat armor crossed with Iron Man. Which isn't actually a bad thing, the character looks cool. Don't get me wrong, but every time I see the suit, and it's even kind of got, you know, pointy ears and stuff, I just keep thinking to myself that, yeah, this is like a fiery brimstone Batman Iron Man hybrid. And in that, it does kind of make it hard for me to see him as his own character because it reminds me so much of these. But like other costume designs and other comics, or heck, even when I watch a new season of Power Rangers, once I get used to it, I think I'll settle out. When it comes to the two villains, there's something about the starting villain of the story with his, you know, green cloak and sort of that green energy aura along with all of the metal, like, armor and stuff on him. Just, to me, 
admittedly kind of reminded me and even looked a little bit like Doctor Doom. And then when it came to Suave, I think I was a little more surprised to find out that it wasn't the Cobra Commander. But again, I don't think there is anything necessarily wrong with these designs in those aspects. It's just my brain tends to trail off when I see things that remind me of other things. But overall, I do think this was a solid first issue. I want to know more about the stone and its origin. I want to see Dylan make a change for the better. I think this is going to be a fun series. And if you're a person who likes tokusatsu mashed up with American styled comics, I do think this is going to be the comic for you. And with that, I'm going to score Rogue Sun issue number one an 8.5 out of 10. So Rogue Sun issue number one. What did you think about this book if you've read it? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you liked this video, I'd love it if you'd smash that like button, share it with some friends, subscribe if you're not subscribed already, and ring that notification bell for more comic book content. And if you're wondering what to watch next, consider one of these two videos. All right, take care, have a great day, and as always, stay geeky.